The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Navigating the Shifting Treatment Paradigm in Estrogen Receptor Positive HER2 Negative Breast Cancer, Harnessing Modern Treatment Options and the Expanding Evidence Base to Better Patient Care and Outcomes in Early and Advanced Disease. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash KVE860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, welcome to today's program by Peerview Live, Navigating the Shifting Treatment Paradigm in ER-Positive HER2-Negative Breast Cancer. We'll review how treatment options and expanding evidence base can improve patient care and outcomes in early and advanced disease. I'm Aditya Bardia, breast medical oncologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, it's my pleasure to have Dr. Hurwitz and Dr. Spring, esteemed panelists who will be doing the discussion today. Dr. Hurwitz. Hi there, I'm from the University of California, Los Angeles. I'm so pleased to be here, thank you. Dr. Spring. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. I am a breast medical oncologist at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. So today we'll review expanding treatment arsenal for ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer, implications for practice. Then we'll have a discussion that will be case-based, Q&A, and then finally conclusions. We have partnered with Living Beyond Breast Cancer to include and advocate for patient perspective in this program. The idea behind living beyond breast cancer is to improve patient outcomes. The thought is that patients should be appropriately informed and educated about their treatment, including clinical trials for which they might be eligible. When selecting treatment options, clinicians and patients should engage in shared decision-making to ensure that the right patient receives the right treatment. Please review and download the Supplemental Resource comp Compendium for educational materials for patients and patient aids for clinicians. Again, thank you to Living Beyond Breast Cancer for participating in this program. Okay, let's start with current standard therapies and their evolving role in advanced and early stage ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer. We'll start with the treatment algorithm. It's a bit complex, but let me walk you through the key components. So for a patient with early stage ER positive breast cancer, in terms of the decision tree, the first thing to consider is, is if a patient has lymph node positive or lymph node negative disease. For a patient who has lymph node negative disease, the next decision tree is if a patient is premenopausal or postmenopausal. If a patient is premenopausal, we look at the Oncotype DX recurrence score to make a decision about endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy with chemotherapy. If a patient has recurrence score of 1 to 15, we would consider adjuvant endocrine therapy alone. A patient who has recurrence score 16 to 25, some may benefit from chemotherapy, particularly if the recurrence score score is more than 20. And then after chemotherapy, consider endocrine therapy. On the other hand, if the recurrence score is more than 26, we would consider chemotherapy first. Often TC times 4 is utilized and then endocrine therapy. In a patient who's postmenopausal, if the recurrence score is one to 25, the recommendation is to consider endocrine therapy alone. But if the recurrence score is more than 26, we would start with chemo and then endocrine therapy. So this is for a patient who has lymph node negative disease. For a patient who has lymph node positive disease, again, the next decision point is whether a patient is pre or postmenopausal. In a patient who's premenopausal, regardless of the recurrence score, the recommendation is to do chemotherapy followed by endocrine therapy. The use of ovarian suppression is strongly recommended in a patient who is premenopausal and has lymph node positive disease. In a patient who's postmenopausal, if the recurrence score is 1 to 25, endocrine therapy alone is recommended. And if the recurrence score is 26 or higher, you can start with chemotherapy followed by adjuvant endocrine therapy. So this is all for early stage ER positive breast cancer. In terms of advanced stage or metastatic breast cancer, 
the recommendation is to start with endocrine therapy plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor as first-line therapy. When the patient has disease progression, that's where genotyping is helpful. If a patient has pic 3 c mutation, recommendation of endocrine therapy plus alpelisib. If a patient has known germline BRCA mutation, consider a PARP inhibitor. For patients who do not have known PIK3C mutation in the tumor or germline BRCA mutation, the recommendation is endocrine therapy, which could be fulvestrin or XMS10 Evrolimus. Then after that, once all the endocrine-based therapy options are exhausted, one would consider chemotherapy. It's always good to consider clinical trials at any phase in the journey of breast cancer. So Dr. Hurwitz, uh, what do you think about the recent developments and new data? Which are the ones you consider important and are excited about? Yeah, it's a really exciting time. We do um, have a lot of new information coming. It seems like every meeting that we have, there's a new study um, that's presented that is potentially practice changing. I think for early stage ER positive breast cancer, certainly the most relevant uh, recent data that are impacting practice are the RX Ponder data and the uh, Monarch E data. Um, RX Ponder answered some questions about lymph node positive early stage disease. We now know that postmenopausal women probably don't benefit from chemo if they have a recurrent score of less than 26, even with one to three positive nodes. But it also, this study also sort of led us to ask more questions about the premenopausal women, where we have not yet really figured out how much chemotherapy is benefiting the tumor or just benefiting the tumor indirectly due to its ovarian suppressive effects. So that is an outstanding question that we still need to address. Abemocyclib for high-risk ER-positive disease has certainly changed practice. We now have this two-year therapy for our patients who have very high-risk ER-positive disease, um, and I think that this is something that we've all begun to implement in our practices, but we're waiting to see the results of Natalie, which is looking at ribocyclib for three years in this uh, setting. So lots of ongoing studies um, in this area. But in terms of the advanced disease, um, we have got just a ton of clinical trials now looking at novel ways of targeting the hormone pathway, as well as novel ways to target pathways that interface with the hormone receptor pathway. So it's a very exciting time. Absolutely, absolutely. A lot of uh, important trials in this space that will likely change the landscape. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Spring, any additional thoughts related to recent developments and things you're excited about? Yeah, I would agree with Dr. Herbert. So that's a really exciting time. It's, you know, when we saw that algorithm that you showed, you almost need to update that very frequently now, you know, compared to in past years where things stayed stagnant for a while. Um, a lot of new studies coming out and ongoing studies. I'd say in terms of some unanswered questions that many of us have been thinking about in the early breast cancer setting, for premenopausal women, the role of ovarian function suppression and if that could be optimized. And you know, the trials like Taylor X and our expander, the percentage of women who had ovarian function suppression was relatively low. So I think that's just a data gap um, that hopefully we'll, you know, we'll get more answers to that with future studies. And in the advanced setting, it's great that we have more options. I think sequencing is going to remain a major topic that can be, you know, hard to explore, right? Trials are designed before new studies, I mean, new agents are approved. Also, of course, we saw the exciting data at ASCO about HER2 low breast cancer, potentially the role of trastuzumab to direct the can for a lot of these patients as well. Yeah, very exciting data at ASCO, which is a great segue. Um, novel ER targeting agents and promising therapeutic option. Dr. Hurwitz, uh, could you review this section? Absolutely. Um, I think we're all aware that patients with hormone receptor positive uh, advanced disease are to date not curable still. Um, and that is because disease resistance develops against hormonally targeted therapies. And while we've had some real impactful uh, advances with respect to CDK4-6 inhibitors and PI3 kinase pathway inhibitors. 
Um, we know that patients who have disease progress after these agents have a very poor prognosis. Um, it seems like uh, we, we hit a home run with the CDK4-6 inhibitors in the frontline and second-line setting, but after patient's disease progresses, um, the outcomes are quite poor. There are a number of emerging options shown on the right side of the slide, including novel CIRMs, novel oral SIRDs, PROTAC technology, SARANs, and CIRCAs that are in development and will likely in the next five years change uh, the way that we treat breast cancer that's hormonally driven. Shown on this um, slide is the mechanism of action of a number of endocrine therapies. Starting first on um, the left side, you can see uh, uh, cancer that has no treatment, and you can see how the estrogen, which is depicted in as red dots, um, will enter because it's a steroid, um, is able to just pass through that, that membrane and uh, lock into the estrogen receptor alpha. And when two of the receptors are engaged with the ligands, they will dimerize and can go into the nucleus of the cell where it actually um, acts on estrogen response elements. Uh, estrogen receptor engaged by the ligand is actually uh, a transcription factor and it allows gene transcription that leads to cell growth and division. On the next panel, you can see aromatase inhibitors interfere with this path pathway by blocking aromatase, so blocking the production of estrogen. Um, one mechanism to circumvent this therapy is uh, the estrogen receptors uh, turning themselves on without estrogen being present. So that's a mechanism of action that's present, for example, when there are ESR1 mutations or mu mutations in the gene for estrogen receptor. Um, in the next panel, you can see the mechanism of action of SIRMs, which blocks the estrogen receptor. There is an antagonistic effect against the ER, um, but with tamoxifen, there's also an agonistic effect, which accounts for its toxicity and for the development of resistance. Then you have uh, SIRDs that actually will um, go in and lead to estrogen receptor deg uh, degradation. And on the far right, um, we have PROTAC technology, which is a very novel mechanism to lead to estrogen receptor de uh, degrading um, by way of tagging the estrogen receptor um, for uh, degradation in the cell. So this is by no means um, a pictorial of all the novel therapies, mechanisms of action, but gives you an idea of how um, investigators and scientists are going about developing novel agents to interfere with this ubiquitous pathway. Um, and as you can see here, the, on the left side, I won't go through it in the interest of time, but there are a number of mechanisms of endocrine resistance and a number of drugs that have been developed to combat this resistance. In the table on the right, you can see a number, number of agents that are currently in development. Many of these have had recent data come out, some of which we'll go through today. Novel CIRMs like lassofoxifene, uh, SIRDs that are orally developed, for example, uh, excuse me, orally delivered, for example, alicestrant, amsinestrant, giridestrant. Um, PROTAC such as ARV471 and CIRCAs such as H3B. So we know that SIRDs um, may be particularly beneficial in patients whose tumors have acquired an ESR1 mutation because SIRDs degrade the estrogen receptor which circumvents this mechanism of resistance. They um, may have greater activity than an aromatase inhibitor in resistant cancers with ESR1 mutations. We know that the original and currently only FDA-approved CIRD is fulvestrant. It is a potent ER uh, degrader, um, but because of its poor bioavailability, it must be given as intramuscular injections, um, which is uh, sometimes not the preferred route by patients. It um, can be painful to have this IM injection on a monthly basis. Um, so a number of scientists have developed novel SIRDs that may be delivered orally, um, as you can see on the left side. And on the right side is a clinical trial which looked at 
shorten the outcomes for patients with metastatic disease treated with exemestane in the blue or fulvestrant in the orange, um, those patients who are wild type for ESR1 um, mutations um, in their tumor do just as well with exemestane or fulvestrant, but on the left side, you can see those tumors that have acquired an ESR1 mutation really benefit more from fulvestrant. However, fulvestrant doesn't work against all ESR1 mutations, so there is still an unmet need to develop agents that target more of these mutations. This um, somewhat complicated slide does show you the frequency of alterations. ESR1 mutations tend to be acquired over time, in contrast to PI3 kinase mutations, which are usually present at the beginning. You can see that patients who are untreated on the left upper graphic um, in light blue have a low incidence of ESR1 mutations on the far left side, and that um, rises with um, uh, hormonal therapy, so post treatment in the dark blue on the left side, you can see close to 20% of patients have acquired mutations after hormonal therapy. And in the bottom graphics, Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see the progression-free survival in patients receiving an aromatase inhibitor who have uh, received an A, uh, uh, who have an ESR1 mutation in the green, uh, they do poorly. Um, but on the right side, if they're treated with uh, a CERD, they tend to do better. And then the graphic on the upper part of the um, slide, upper right side, does show the pattern and frequency of mutations. And you can see um, mutations, uh, for example, in ESR1 hotspots uh, tend to be acquired over time. What you can see here are the uh, locations of various ESR1 mutations. Just looking at the ligand binding uh, portion of the gene, this is where most of the mutations occur, and you can see whether they're missense, um, denoted in green, uh, or in frame or truncating, denoted by those colors. The most common mutation is the D538G, but we also have patients who have a smattering of other mutations, and the type of mutation may impact sensitivity to various SERDs that are in development. One very interesting uh, clinical trial was developed called PADA-1. This was a phase three study, very ambitious and elegant design to look at whether the development of ESR1 mutations in patients who are on frontline palbociclib with an aromatase inhibitor will predict for benefit to switching to a CERD. So uh, over a thousand patients were enrolled in step one in which um, patients received, all received aromatase inhibitor with palbociclib. Patients had blood testing done at the baseline at month one and then every two months to see if they had developed an ESR1 mutation by ctDNA analysis. If they did develop a rising ESR1 mutation in the absence of overt progression of disease, they moved on to step two where they were randomized to palbo AI, which they were continuing on, or palbo with fulvestrant. And then at the time of progression disease, they were allowed to have crossover. Interestingly, you can see that patients uh, during the first six months of palbo with AI, the vast majority were wild type for ESR1. 81% were wild type. And then after uh, six months of uh, palbo with AI, you see on, on the reverse that ESR1 mutation is uh, demonstrated in 53%, just showing this is an acquired mutation. And so um, they also looked at the patients who had an ESR1 mutation detected at inclusion, and you can see that ESR1 mutations were cleared in a lot of patients on um, uh, therapy with Palbo and an AI, and their outcome was better if their ESR1 mutation cleared. At San Antonio in 2021, an analysis was done to look at the randomized uh, step two and showed that patients who were randomly assigned to palbociclib fulvestrant when, their, um, when they had an ESR1 uh, mutation rise noted had a statistically significant improved progression-free survival. It was um, uh, very in interesting findings suggesting that 
thumb, perhaps you could improve PFS. What's missing, however, is demonstrating that overall survival uh, was beneficial because, of course, patients in the palpable AI arm were allowed to cross over. So again, this study um, elicits more questions than, I an than it answers, I think, um, but it is interesting proof of con concept information. And then finally, there are so many novel agents. I've lost track of how many novel um, ER targeted therapies are under investigation now. Um, I counted 11, 11 at the last check. Um, I'm not sure that this is an exhaustive list, but it does give you an example of where the field is going, uh, the number of trials on the far right side that are evaluating these therapies, uh, and with a lot of uh, recent data being presented. And I think in our next section, we'll go through some of these data. Thank you, Dr. Horvitz. Um, over the next five to 10 minutes, I'll review the different oral surges in clinical development and completed ongoing trials. We'll start with the Emerald trial. The Emerald trial was a global phase three randomized trial that looked at elacestrant versus endocrine therapy of physician's choice in the second, third line ER positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer setting. The trial required that patients should have received prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. 239 patients received elacestrant, 238 received standard of care endocrine therapy. Because the trial had dual co-primary endpoints of progression-free survival in the overall population and progression-free survival in patients with ESR1 mutant tumors, it's also important to look at the ESR1 mutant uh, subgroup. 115 patients received elacestrant and 113 received standard of care. There are two important things to note in the Emerald trial. The first is that this was a patient population that predominantly had vistal metastases. 70% of patients in this trial, while it was ER positive, had vistal metastases. And second is that a number of patients had also received one line of chemotherapy. About 20, 25% of patients in the trial had received prior chemotherapy. And these are important factors that influence the prognosis that was seen in this clinical trial. In terms of primary outcome, the study met its primary outcome. Patients who received elacestrant had superior progression-free survival as compared to those who received standard of care this corresponded to a hazard ratio of 0.69. And if you look at ESR1 mutant subgroup, you could clearly see separation of the curves and the hazard ratio was more impressive, hazard ratio of 0.54, so almost doubling of survival in patients who received elacestrant as compared to standard of care endocrine therapy. And biologically, this makes sense as Dr. Horvitz reviewed, Tumors that have ESR1 mutations are still dependent on the ER pathway, so targeting ER directly by oral surge like elacestrant is likely going to show a differential effect as compared to standard endocrine therapy. Now, a thing that has um, resulted in a significant debate is about what's the best metric to look at uh, in this clinical trial. If we look at the curves carefully, we see that initially there's a drop in both arms, and then after that, you start seeing separation of the curves. So the initial drop in both arms is likely due to endocrine resistance. It's likely uh, those patients who have endocrine-resistant tumors, and in that setting, any endocrine therapy is not going to show benefit as monotherapy. But then when you look at endocrine-sensitive tumors, which is the later part of the curve, you start to see separation. So it provides scientific proof of principle that in the endocrine sensitive setting, the use of a better endocrine agent will demonstrate superiority over standard uh, therapy. And so accordingly, a better metric in this setting where you see an initial drop and then separation is the PFS rate. And if you look at PFS rate at 12 months, so that's PFS rate at one year, the proportion of patients who were on elacestrant was much higher as compared to standard endocrine therapies. For example, PFS rate at 12 months was 26.8% with elacestrant versus 8.2% with standard endocrine therapy in the ESR1 mutant subgroup. 
And if you look at elastestrant versus fulvestrant, the trial allowed patients to receive endocrine therapy of physician's choice. About two thirds of patients received fulvestrant. So if you compare elastestrant, which is an oral surd, versus fulvestrant, which is an IM surd, again, you see similar results, an initial drop, and then you see a separation of the curves, and results are particularly significant in tumors that have ESR1 mutations. In terms of subgroups, all subgroups derive benefit. And then finally, in terms of overall survival, the results are not mature at this time. You do see a trend towards improved overall survival with elastestrant as compared to standard of care endocrine therapy, but the results are not mature and we anticipate mature data later this year or early 2023. When we talk about any therapy, we have to consider both efficacy and toxicity. So in terms of safety, um, grade three, grade four AEs were seen, but the incidence was in single digits and treatment related AEs leading to discontinuation of either elastestrant or standard of care was infrequent, less than 10% in both arms. And in terms of the specific AEs, nausea was the most common side effect seen with elastestrant, grade three nausea being 2.5%, and this was not seen with standard of care endocrine therapy. The other AEs were pretty much similar between elastestrant and standard of care endocrine therapy. So we reviewed elastestrant that has demonstrated um, positive phase three data as compared to standard endocrine therapy, but that's not the only oral surge in clinical development. There are other oral surges in clinical development as well. One example is amsenestrant that was evaluated initially in a phase one trial. And essentially demonstrated proof of principle activity in pre-treated patients with ER positive or negative breast cancer. The response rate uh, was seen in some patients. You could also see decline in ctDNA. It's very tough to uh, draw strong conclusions from phase one results, but essentially it provides proof of principle that the drug has some activity. And overall was very well tolerated in terms of side effects. So this has led to a number of pivotal phase three trials with amsenestrant, uh, starting with Amira 3, which was a trial very similar to Emerald, comparing amsenestrant versus physician's choice of endocrine therapy. We've just seen a press release that the trial did not meet its primary endpoint and look forward to seeing full results. Amira 04 is evaluating amsenestrant versus letrozole in the neoadjuvant setting. Data presented at ASCO showed that uh, amsenestrant did lead to KI67 suppression. Amira 5 is looking at amsenestrant plus palbocyclib versus aromatase inhibitor plus palbocyclib as first line therapy for ER positive or to negative metastatic breast cancer. We've not seen results yet. And similarly, AMIRA-6 uh, is an ongoing study looking at amsenestrant versus tamoxifen as adjuvant therapy. So this is an early breast cancer setting and specifically is focused on patients who've discontinued AI uh, for side effects. So in that subpopulation, it's looking at amsenestrant versus tamoxifen and the trial is actively enrolling. Another third is jodecestrant, uh, and similar to amsenestrant and elacestrant, was evaluated in a phase one trial, single agent as well as combination therapy, and provided proof of principal activity. Uh, responses were seen in uh, pretreated patients, and this has led to pivotal phase three trials uh, in, uh, evaluating jodecestrant plus palbocyclib as first line therapy, as well as evaluating jodecestrant in early breast cancer, for example, the COOPERA trial, for which Dr. Hurwitz is the PI, evaluated jodecestrant plus palbocyclib versus AI plus palbocyclib in the neoadjuvant setting, with KI67 being the primary endpoint. Updated results presented at ASCO 2022 showed that patients who received jodecestrant plus palbocyclib had higher KI67 reduction as compared to AI plus palbocyclib. So that provides proof of principle at least from a proliferation reduction perspective, jodecestrant is superior to an aromatase inhibitor. And this has led to a large phase three clinical trial in the adjuvant setting called the LIDERA trial, evaluating jodecestrant versus treatment of physician's choice in the adjuvant setting. 
And besides these, there are other oral SERDs in clinical development as well. Uh, there's the Lily SERD called Immunolestrant, uh, a SERD by uh, G1 Therapeutics called Rintodestrant and other SERDs as well. All of them have been evaluated in the phase one trial with proof of principal clinical activity. And there are ongoing planned studies with these different SERDs in metastatic and early breast cancer as well. And this is just about oral SERDs. Besides SERDs, there are other agents as well, Circas, Protax, Serans, and Dr. Spring will review those. Thank you. So as you heard, there's a number of other agents. Um, we won't be able to review all of them, but as you heard earlier, um, there's some broad classes. So we'll review Circas, um, specifically H3B, and there's both several ongoing trials with that agent. And we'll also discuss the PROTAC ARV471. Here we see results from a phase one, two study of H3B in advanced ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer. Shown are some of the efficacy results. So overall, there was an objective response rate of 17% and a clinical benefit rate of 40%. This was a heavily pretreated population, but did show initial evidence of efficacy. And here are some of the PFS data and also looking at it by ESR1 subtype as well. So as you see, de depending on the type of ESR1 mutation, different PFS results were seen. Shown here is a phase two study of H3B, again, an advanced ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer. As you can see in the phase one part, different doses were explored, and the phase two is studying a dose of 450 milligrams. Here shown is the efficacy amongst different subgroups and efficacy was seen um, really regardless of subgroup studied. Here is the PFS in the overall population and according to ESR1 mutation subtype status. Again, as shown earlier, the results did vary depending on the type of ESR1 mutation and specifically the Y537S mutation had the longest PFS with a median PFS of 7.3 months. Next, we'll talk about ARV471. As you heard, this is a novel PROTAC estrogen receptor degrader. Here it was studied in ER positive HER2 negative locally advanced or metastatic breast cancer and did show early evidence of efficacy. The clinical benefit rate was 40%. And importantly, responses were seen really regardless of prior endocrine therapies and also regardless of prior CDK4-6 inhibitor exposure or not. Shown here are the adverse events that were seen. And this is based on different dose levels as well. Not surprisingly at higher doses, some more side effects were seen, but overall it was a relatively well-tolerated agent. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Spring, for reviewing the CIRCAS and CIRANS. A uh, lot of endocrine therapies in clinical development. So let's put all of this together and talk about practical considerations for integrating these latest therapies in the clinical care for patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So we'll have a case-based discussion. I'll, uh, we have three cases. I'll start with the uh, first one a 54-year-old female with stage 2 ER-positive HER2-negative breast cancer uh, who was diagnosed four years ago, received ACT and then adjuvant uh, AI, unfortunately had disease recurrence on adjuvant AI, developed red hip, uh, right hip pain, imaging revealed lytic bone lesions at scans, which also showed liver metastases besides bone metastases. Biopsy of the liver revealed hormone receptive positive HER2-negative breast cancer, Patient also had NGS testing of the tissue, which revealed a PIK3C mutation. So the question is, what would you recommend as the first line therapy for this patient with metastatic disease who had disease recurrence on adjuvant AI? Would you do full vestrant alone, full vestrant alpelisib, full vestrant with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, XMS to nevrolimus, capecitabine, or something else? We all Bring it to the panel, uh, Dr. Hurwitz, what would you consider for this patient? Uh, 
It's an interesting case. Um, also interesting that NGS testing was done up front. Sometimes people wait until after the first line setting. Um, and I think it's interesting, she did not have an ESR1 mutation in the tumor in spite of being on the aromatase inhibitor for three years or more. Um, and so um, the pic 3 ca mutation, in my opinion, doesn't actually change my initial recommendation. We know that CDK4-6 inhibitors um, benefit patients profoundly in terms of progression-free survival and have data supporting the use of two CDK4-6 inhibitors for improvement in overall survival in a patient whose disease has recurred while on an aromatase inhibitor. Um, and that benefit does seem to be regardless of whether the tumor has a PIK3CA mutation. So in the frontline setting or in a patient like this whose disease has recurred on an aromatase inhibitor, in spite of having a PIK3CA mutation, which we know may be prognostic for shorter um, PFS long-term, um, it's not predictive for lack of benefit from a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So in my opinion, I would switch this patient's AI to full vestrant, and I would initiate treatment with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Personally, I would choose ribocyclib based on the Mona Lisa 3 clinical trial, which showed um, benefit uh, with the use of full vestrant plus ribocyclib in patients who had previously untreated metastatic ER positive breast cancer or, ther or treatment like in this situation, having progression or recurrence while on an AI. Um, and it showed not only an improvement in PFS, but also OS. Uh, we do have another CDK4-6 inhibitor that's shown overall survival benefit in combination uh, with fulvestrant, and that is a bemocyclib based on the Monarch 2 clinical trial, and that study showed not only an improved PFS, but OS, so that would be equally appropriate. The reason I would lean toward RIVO compared to a BEMA, because we don't have any head-to-head -head trials comparing the two, is um, because in my opinion, the tolerability is a bit better with ribocyclib in terms of GI toxicity, so patients are a little less aware that they're on a therapy like this. I would preserve the use of alpalacib uh, for the second line setting. That's great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Horvitz. And a very important point, just because there's a pic 3 c mutation does not mean you have to select alpalacib in this setting, particularly with the overall survival data we've seen with ribocyclib and abemocyclib in this setting, and a trend towards overall survival with alpalacib, but not a statistically significant improvement in overall survival. So it would be reasonable to start with CDK4-6 inhibitor and then later on consider alpalacib and other therapies. How about uh, just a slight modification to the case, uh, uh, continuing the abemocyclib theme, if this patient had stage three disease and received abemocyclib in the adjuvant setting along with endocrine therapy, and then had disease recurrence, say a couple of years after completing two years of uh, adjuvant abemocyclib, uh, what would you consider in the first line therapy, uh, Dr. Spring? Uh, so similar case, just higher risk and patient also received abemocyclib in the adjuvant setting. Yeah, so I think this is a situation we haven't experienced yet, any of us, uh, but we know we will at some point. And so there's been a lot of discussion around this. I think similar to with other agents and how we think about this is, you know, the timing related to when a bemocyclib was stopped compared to when the progression occurred. Um, and there's, I think, a few different scenarios to think of. One is a patient who seems to recur right after a bemocyclib is stopped. So there you're actually thinking, well, maybe I was treating metastatic disease. And then when I stopped it, perhaps it became more overt. I think the case you described was a, a longer interval, right? Perhaps a couple of years later. And so there, I think I would uh, feel comfortable trying a CDK4-6 inhibitor again. I think that's where perhaps NGS might be helpful just to see, you know, did any resistance mutations develop or not? I think it's nice that we have three CDK4-6 inhibitors. In addition to this future situation you describe where it might be helpful, I think we also know some patients sometimes just tolerate one better than another or may have comorbidities that make them ineligible for one of the CDK4-6 inhibitors. Like say they're on QTC prolonging medications that could present a challenge for ribocyclib or perhaps they have Crohn's disease and that would present a challenge for a bemocyclib. 
That's great. Uh, and thank you for reviewing a future case scenario. That's very helpful. Let's go on to case two. Uh, this is related to early breast cancer. A 54-year-old postmenopausal woman undergoes mastectomy and axillary dissection is found to have a six centimeter grade two tumor, invasive lobular carcinoma, three positive nodes, and an oncotype DX score of eight. Uh, tumor was ERPR positive, HER2 technically negative, although I guess we'll be using HER2 low as a new classification in the future. So any further evaluation or testing needed and what treatment would you recommend, uh, Dr. Spring? This is a very interesting case as well. There's a couple of things to point out. So her tumor is six centimeters, so technically T3. T3 tumors were generally underrepresented and sometimes um, ineligible for some of the oncotype uh, studies. However, from a tumor biology standpoint, I don't think we feel it's much different if you're a larger T2 uh, versus a T3. So I wouldn't worry about that too much, but I think the other key points are the three positive lymph nodes and then this very favorable oncotype score of eight, um, showing you know from a tumor biology standpoint that this is a breast cancer that's very much unlikely to benefit from chemotherapy. And she is postmenopausal as well. So in thinking about the Rxponder data, I would feel very comfortable recommending against chemotherapy for her. And in addition to focusing on optimizing endocrine therapy with an aromatase inhibitor, where we do know in some studies that perhaps uh, invasive lobular carcinoma in, in particular gets more benefit out of AIs as well. I think this is a situation where we'd also think about adjuvant abemacyclib. Now the approval for it would technically require a KI-67 uh, to be assessed. But in thinking about the broader intention to treat population, in this case, she would meet that, the one to three positive lymph node group due to the tumor being T3. Um, if the tumor were not T3, given it was not grade three, that's where the KI-67, if it were um, above 20%, would also be intention to treat. But as I said, that's not as applicable here, given it's T3. That's great. Any additional thoughts, uh, Dr. Horvitz? Yeah, no, I agree completely. I think um, uh, Dr. Spring highlighted all of the important points. I, I think the KI-67 requirement by the FDA is quite interesting because benefit was seen in spite of whether patients had high or low KI-67 as long as they met the criteria for entry on the trial. Of course, patients with a high KI-67 um, have a worse outcome and may benefit a little bit more, but there was still significant benefit for those with low KI-67 who qualified for the trial. And as a result, I think a number of um, guidelines have come out supporting the use of abemacyclib regardless of KI-67 as long as other criteria are met. And that helps us with getting insurance approval and dealing with that sort of sticky issue, some centers not testing KI-67, uh, we know that that marker is very uh, variable uh, from lab to lab. Unless you get over 30%, it's, it's very hard to distinguish values between 20 and 30%. So um, I don't think she needs additional testing to utilize a bemocyclib, but being true to the approval, one might do that. That's great. And hopefully in the future, we'll have additional biomarker data as well, including MAMA print oncotype DX in this situation from Monarchy. So moving on to the last case, 54-year-old um, female, uh, similar to case one, essentially who had disease recurrence on adjuvant AI, PIK3CA mutation, was started on full Western plus palbocyclib, and then after 24 months had disease progression. So the question is, what would you consider next for this patient, full Western talpelisib, XMS de nevrolimus, clinical trial with an ER agent uh, or something else. We did cover that, but we'll bring it to Dr. Hurwitz and Dr. Spring next in terms of any additional thoughts. Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, she had liver metastases and bone metastases. We knew based on the initial testing that she her tumor has a PIK3CA mutation. She appropriately began therapy with fulvestrant and a CDK4-6 inhibitor and had a very good outcome, nice two-year PFS. Um, the next line of therapy that I would strongly consider is alpelisib. 
Um, however, the Solar One study combined alpelacib with fulvestrant, and this patient's disease is progressing on fulvestrant. Um, so outside, I, of course, would first consider a clinical trial. Um, there are a number of clinical studies ongoing now looking at novel uh, SIRDs, novel PI3 kinase pathway inhibitors, um, uh, and other uh, endocrine-based therapies. And so I, I would first look for that. And there's a lot of studies in this second-line setting. So that would be my, my ideal first choice. But in the absence of that, um, I would consider alpelacib with an aromatase inhibitor. We have data uh, supporting that decision from the BILEAVE clinical trial that Hope Rugo ran, looking at the use of alpelacib in combination with AIs in patients who started with fulvestrant and, um, uh, and a CDK4-6 inhibitor showing encouraging progression-free survival benefit at six months, meeting its primary endpoint. So we do have some data to support it. The issue with alpelacib is tolerability with hyperglycemia, diarrhea, and rash being uh, very significant toxicities that patients can experience and can impact patients' quality of life, requiring a lot of monitoring and a lot of hand-holding in the first few months. So myself, I'm very selective about who I'm going to offer alpelacib to. I want to make sure that there are good candidates and able to comply with the close monitoring required. Um, you could consider use of everolimus if a patient wasn't a good candidate, if they had out-of-control diabetes or um, other um, aversions to being on uh, alpelacib. The Bolero 2 study did show benefit with everolimus and exemestane regardless of the presence of PIK3CA mutations, so that certainly could be considered. And I think capecitabine is not a bad choice either. Um, we don't have um, studies comparing capecitabine to PI3 kinase uh, inhibitor alpelacib in this post-CDK4-6 setting. Um, I think that would be a very interesting question to answer from a clinical trial perspective because liver progression may be a particularly poor prognostic group where a little bit more aggressive therapy is indicated. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of unknowns as well, and it's good to have more than one option uh, for this patient. Any closing thoughts, uh, Dr. Spring, before we move on? Yeah, I would agree. I think this is a situation where you do have, fortunately, multiple options and shared decision making would be important and also would agree, you know, hopefully there is a great clinical trial option, um, as this is a definitely a very common Base that a lot of trials are investigating, just thinking about some of the next generation PIK3CA inhibitors that are much more mutant selective, where we're you know, seeing sometimes no hyperglycemia. And actually, I want to bring a point related to the hyperglycemia and why I actually tend to favor NGS testing in the first line. Often it might come back you know, after a patient's already started first line therapy. But I do think it's an opportunity when you identify a PIK3CA mutation early, you can optimize glucose control if that is um, an issue for the patient, for example, starting maybe metformin in advance, if you kind of know that's a future therapy choice. That's a great point. And I would only add um, two points. One is this patient had NGS testing at the beginning, and it's been two years, and we know from PADA1 that uh, ESR1 mutations are acquired in a large percentage of patients um, as they're on um, therapy. Now, she was on fulvestrant, but fulvestrant doesn't hit all ESR1 mutations. So I would consider doing um, NGS testing again to determine the, the partner for alpelacib, if that was the agent I would use um, to see if she had an ESR1 mutation. The other um, thing I'd bring up that was brought up in the beginning of the program is we now have a therapy TDXD for her too low breast cancer. And if this patient is um, really deemed to be a, a chemo candidate based on um, burden of disease uh, or aggressiveness of the progression, one could consider using TDXD here if her HER2 IHC was one plus or two plus. Well, great points. And, and maybe can I ask the panel a question? If um, in this setting, when you want repeat NGS, would you favor a repeat liver biopsy and performing it on tissue, or would you feel comfortable with a liquid biopsy in this setting? 
In my opinion, I would prefer to do a liquid biopsy um, because it's a little bit um, off the reservation to repeatedly do it. I like to do it, but I like to do it as easily as possible. Um, so unless I had a clinical trial where the patient needed an extra biopsy, I, I tend to avoid repeat liver biopsy if, if I can. Yeah, I agree as well. Uh, and it's fairly convenient to do a liquid biopsy. This patient would need blood work anyways to look at hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C, blood sugars, liver function. So you could also send a tube of blood for plasma-based genotyping. And, and that could tell you information about whether the patient has ESR1 mutation or not which could be helpful for selection of endocrine therapy. And in the future, maybe with novel ER degraders as well, which is a good segue to the last section. And that's uh, how would you select and sequence all these novel ER degraders? There are multiple ER degraders in development, first line, second, third line setting. So how do you choose and how would you select them if more than one get approved? Start with uh, Dr. Horvitz. Yeah, I think this <clears throat> this is a question that I think we are all asked a lot. We're being asked to um, sort of bet on the best, and it's really hard to do because we don't have a whole lot of information. I mean, Emerald is the first phase three trial to report out, and so <clears throat> I think it's an unfair for us to compare the toxicity profiles or efficacy profiles when the patient populations differ so much in these early phase trials. Um, that said, I think as a whole, we're watching for GI side effects with these agents, and we're watching for cardiac side effects with these agents, primarily in terms of bradycardia or QTC prolongation, which can be a problem if you're combining it with other pathway inhibitors. Um, I am excited by data that's been reported from Jira Destrant. Um, I am also um, impressed with early data from ARV471. And there is a novel um, CIRM that was presented at ASCO this year, Lazofoxifene. I think I'm butchering the name, but it's a, a novel CIRM combined with a bemacyclib that showed really interesting objective response rate of about 50% and a PFS around 13 months in patients who had received a prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. I don't think I've seen data like that in this setting. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing studies where this is evaluated a bit further, but um, I'm eagerly enrolling patients on clinical trials evaluating these agents so that we can have more data. Absolutely. And looks like it might be like the CDK4-6 inhibitors in the future. If multiple endocrine agents get approved, it would not just be the efficacy, but also the relative safety profile that will help with selection. And clinical trials are important. So on the topic of clinical trials, uh, Dr. Spring, um, we strongly encourage clinical trial participation, particularly in the community setting. So any strategies to improve clinical trial participation. You're running a nice program related to virtual precision medicine and referrals. So do, could you comment on how to improve trial participation and how to increase diversity? Really important questions. I think academic community collaboration is so important. And in some areas that's kind of set up naturally where an academic site may be affiliated with several community sites. Um, and I know that's, that's the situation with our institution. And so, by being linked with those sites, it's easier to both share and educate about studies. And that's also a way to reach populations that are underrepresented in studies. But as we've discussed, I mean, the number of trials and agents uh, out there is really mind boggling at this point. So I think to have disease subspecialists involved to help support community sites is incredibly important. In addition to our clinical trial pre-screening program, we also have a liaison role where the breast oncologist um, is tied to network sites to help uh, support them in decision-making regarding both standard of care and clinical trials. And hopefully that'll continue to help with trial participation and diversity. It was a big theme at ASCO and even next year, um, involvement of patients is in the tagline in terms of the ASCO theme. So we'll have the final question to Dr. Hurwitz uh, about this idea of we're moving in the era of patient-centered care. 
So how do you and your team approach patient education so they understand their options and can participate in uh, clinical care decisions? It's a really huge uh, and hugely important point, um, shared decision making, because um, I think patients need to be armed with as much information about efficacy and safety, tolerability, quality of life as they possibly can be um, when they partner with us in deciding what treatment to have. These are long discussions that take um, a considerable amount of time in clinic. And so um, I personally know I will look at my schedule um, a week or so in advance um, and make sure that the clinic has allowed me enough time to have a discussion when we do have a patient who we know has a recurrence or progression. Um, we change it from a 15-minute check-in to a 30-minute appointment. And we also book out follow-up appointments weekly for the first month into therapy with my nurse practitioner um, to check in regarding tolerability um, and uh, as well as adherence to the therapy to make sure there aren't any problems with understanding, directions. Some of our treatments are not given continuously. Some are given twice daily, not once daily. Some mandate the use of, of supportive medications to help with tolerability. So it is very complex. We also utilize a number of written um, and um, uh, materials just for patients. Um, there are certain, you can go to platforms and download. We put them in our patients after visit summary in our electronic medical records. They can refer to information and you know, sometimes it takes two or three visits for a patient to make a decision. And when you talk about ER positive, HER2 negative breast cancer, we have to keep in mind patients do have the ability to take two to four weeks to decide the right therapy, including clinical trials. The, the, this doesn't need to be rushed. Um, the vast majority of patients with this subtype of breast cancer can take the time needed to make the right choice for them. Oh, that's a very good point. We want, we should do monitoring in general, but particularly when a patient starts a new therapy, this close monitoring and education is critical. And education need not be static. It could be a dynamic process. I very much like the idea of these weekly visits early on so you can continue the education and refine as needed. Thank you to the wonderful panelists for the uh, wonderful discussion today. It was very engaging. We covered the key elements related to evidence as well as education. So thank you to Dr. Horvitz and Dr. Spring for participating today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerreview.com forward slash KVE 860. This activity is supported by educational grants from ISI Incorporated and Sanofi.